Uh, good morning again, everyone. Uh, my name is Rob Kruger. Uh, I'm the interim head of the Social Science and Policy Studies Department at WPI and uh, the director of the Institute of Science and Technology for Development. It's really a collaborative, so I call myself the convener of that group. Um, it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce Dean William Gorowando from the National University of Science and Technology in Zimbabwe. Dean Gorowando is the executive dean of the Faculty of Industrial Technology at, uh, at the National University in Zimbabwe. He's a registered professional engineer with a bachelor's degree in engineering with honors uh, and another degree in industrial engineering. He has a master of science in manufacturing systems and operations management, as well as a PhD. He has a strong track record in both private industry and in academia. Uh, for a number of years, he worked for companies such as Shell um, and Tumal Fiber Cement um, before coming back to academia uh, in, to become uh, the dean of the National uh, of the um, School of Engineering. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dean Gorwanda, one of our newest partners. Uh, in our Africa initiatives, and uh, I'll turn it over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Rob, for that uh, introduction. And I'm delighted to be part of uh, this discussion. And this far, I've enjoyed the presentation by His Excellency, the Ambassador of Ghana, uh, highlighting aspects of uh, what transpires uh, across uh, continents and particularly in Africa. My presentation would uh, dwell much on the partnership that we have with WPI, and I term it mutually beneficial international partnerships between NAST and uh, WPI. As the introduction has been said, I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering, and I'll talk briefly about the National University of Science and Technology, and particularly the Faculty of Engineering. Then I'll also discuss the issues of collaboration that we have had so far with um, the WPI. You can go to the next slide, please. The National University of Science and Technology is one of uh, several universities in Zimbabwe. It is uh, situated in Bulawayo, which is the second largest uh, city in Zimbabwe. Um, the university has a student population of about 10,000, and it has got seven faculties, and the Faculty of Engineering is one of the seven. The vision of the National University of uh, Science and Technology is mainly to teach and research in science, technology, and engineering with the view of um, being innovative and creating entrepreneurs out of the teaching and learning that will be happening. And there's the issue of uh, industrialization, which uh, the university wants to focus on. And from that vision, the Faculty of Engineering then developed a mission, which now seeks to use science, technology, and engineering to contribute towards that uh, uh, vision. And we are looking at uh, mainly looking at advanced science, technology, and engineering uh, with um, the view of spearheading research. And with the research, it's not just research on our own, it is collaborative research with the partners in industry and internationally. And one such um, uh, collaboration with WPI helps us in trying to achieve that. The issue of industrialization, modernization, and sustainable development, which are actually key in our endeavor to contribute towards the, the university's vision. So stakeholder engagement is also paramount because we have got communities that we live in. We have got the nation internationally. 
we also have stakeholders. So we need their engagement in order to move forward. So in the um, uh, Faculty of Engineering, we have five main departments who contribute towards that. We have chemical engineering, we have got civil engineering, electronic engineering, we have fiber and polymer materials engineering, and we have industrial and manufacturing engineering. These um, engineering departments actually collaborate and work with each other towards uh, achieving that uh, mission. So our partnership with WPI also enhances the work within the departments, within the other faculties at the university and also across. Next slide, please. So far, we have had a partnership with WPI, uh, and uh, the one that is quite uh, uh, remarkable is uh, the response that we did to the COVID-19. There was initiation of an online training for lecturers and staff, and this was on 3D printing of uh, personal protective equipment as a response to the COVID pandemic and the ventilator components as well. We have had about 40 lecturers and the students who participated in the eight week training. And then we have since received a 3D printer as part of that response. And that 3D printer has started uh, working in printing um, insets for the face shields as part of the um, protective equipment uh, um development then this now would then lead to sustain the product development and engagement because the mou that we have is such that we continuously engage and find areas where we can then develop further apart from this response which happened to the covid 19 pandemic the 3d printer and the capabilities that was bestowed in our students and lecturers will then be taken forward. Then there was also the aspect of online training for African University, a project that necessitated now the response to COVID-19 pandemic and the guidelines of the World Health Organization on social distancing. And then our universities at some times may be congested, but this particular one would then um, accelerate the adoption of technology, particularly on online teaching and learning. The faculty will then be equipped with how to, to develop content for online, how to deliver it, and how to interact with the students. Then there are also aspects of um, uh, public interest technology, university network challenge, an important development where the model is seeking to say, we have got lecturers, we have uh, research capacity researchers at the university. How then do they become important in the communities that they live in? So this would then identify uh, problems areas and then create practical and project specific experiences, which is then transmitted. And the network is such that it will help in developing what we have locally because as the National University of Science and Technology and also um, the communities actually do have indigenous knowledges that can actually be used. And with research, it can then be coupled together to then develop solutions in, um, in communities. And when this is done, the dissemination of knowledge and technology would then have the mutually beneficial relationship to saying we have got uh, indigenous knowledges that need probably further research or being adopted as they are to uh, to co combat specific problems and it's important uh, uh, to consider that as we develop this um, uh, relationship next slide please then another project of interest is the innovation on in e-waste materials recovery. We have a lot of uh, electronic waste which uh, lies around and it's a headache for the 
municipalities and even the nation to disperse. So we have had initiated a multi-institution collaborative research with WPR and is to look at the electronic waste where we collect and try to see uh, the value chain that can actually process the waste without damaging people. And this approach uh, facilitates probably some innovation in researching on how to deal with electronic waste because the headache goes beyond those that procure. Uh, it covers also how then in the product life cycle do you deal with aspects that damage the environment. So if you get a um, useful product from it, it is the innovation that actually has value in doing that. So these um, projects which we have started in the memorandum of uh, understanding and agreements that we have with WPI will be such that uh, there will be interaction between uh, researchers at WPI PI, and those uh, at the National University of Science and Technology. Um, and it also extends into resource sharing with online learning, we'll be having a lot of aspects that uh, need virtual interaction. And with that, we can actually have access into timely resolution of problems or research areas that would have uh, come our way. So I would also want to talk about the engineer of the future. This is in view of where we are as NAST in Zimbabwe, what we are faced with. We have got problems that are occurring and the vision and mission that I talked to, to um, earlier on, it tries to say we want to industrialize, but how do we do that? Do we take time or we want to do it in the shortest possible time available? So there are key competencies that uh, are required. So our lecturers uh, need to then identify how they can best um, impact these uh, competencies in the uh, engineering students. There is the issue of innovation and creativity. We cannot rely on what we have always done. We need to be innovative. The problems that we are faced with are changing and we need now to be innovative to find solution about that. So the, those competencies are required to be innovative, to be creative. There is also the concept of thinker doer, which I have liked the, again to say, we have problems on the ground. You may be not innovative, think about it, write research about it, but we need to go on the ground and the physical on the ground to resolve the problem. Then there is the issue of dynamic and technology conscious. There are technologies which are available, which can help to speed up the resolution of problems that we are faced with. So our engineer of the future needs to actually look at situations where we are saying, there are changes, how am I adapting? The more you don't adapt to any changes, you are actually being left behind. So we want our, you know, uh, our engineer of the future to um, be very dynamic and uh, be conscious of technology. I, these are not all the key competence that, competences that are required of the engineer of the future, but it details those that will make quick impact if we incorporate them in our curriculum. And these, as I put them, are guided by globalization, where we have the whole world become a global village and there is a speed of communication and interaction. So if we can adopt and jump onto that bandwagon, we would actually have certain sections remaining behind. So I'm grateful with the in international partnership or collaborations like this, we can actually have real time um, transfer of uh, technology or cooperation, which involves our faculty, which involves our students, and we can be part of the people who are contributing to solving problems in their localities. There are also developments in artificial intelligence, and in artificial intelligence, uh, these developments are growing very fast. And we also need to say, yes, the engineer can do this much, 
but there is also machine power or the computer, which also has come into play. The interface there also needs to be managed. Then last but not least, we have new problems which are facing future generations. The problems that we have had before are the problems that we might have now, but the dynamics of the problems have changed and this will be um, a different ball game in the future. I would say this is what I would um, recommend to say as we develop curricula, as we look at the problems that we are faced with, these key competencies as guided by those three items need to be looked into. I would like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to share our engagement with WPI and we look, look forward to this partnership in resolving or even making um, groundbreaking uh, researches and even solutions to the problems that we are faced with. I thank you. Thank you, Dean Gorwando. Um, very enthusiastic crowd today. Um, yeah, I had. <laughs> so um, what we'll do now is we'll move on to the next stage of the uh, event, which is to um, have a panel discussion. Um, Dean Gorwando just beautifully kicked it off with his uh, inspiring and um, you know, a, a really nice speech that talked about the the relationship that we have uh, with NUST and how quickly it, it has evolved. And um, I, I met him only a few months ago. And when I heard him speak, I said, he's, he's got to come talk at this um, event because uh, it it was amazing. It, it was like uh, he was, he and Wally were channeling each other. So um, without further delay, I would like to I'm going to switch up the schedule a little bit because we have some teaching conflicts arising. So I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Terence McGoldrick from Providence College um, as our next speaker. Hi, everyone. And uh, I'm so happy to be here today and congratulate uh, WPI and the community on this new initiative with its global school. Um, I am the president of a small NGO. Our name is called the Global Sustainable Aid Project. And um, our mission, we're in about 20 countries, is to create programs that foster empowerment and self-sufficiency with a strong emphasis on WASH and on education. And we have centers in Pukwasi, Ghana, and in Katali, Kenya. And um, we have been um, really, our, our programs have really been eclipsed by the invention of a toilet, a very composting toilet by a late, my late colleague, Stephen Mecca invented this. He's in our physics department at Providence College. And we worked together for several years, uh, teaching people how to build these toilets. Um, the, to the worms eat all the pathogens, the toilets don't smell. And as you can see, they incorporate a hand washing for sanitation. They won a $100,000 prize from the Gates Foundation about uh, seven years ago. And uh, we now have a very large project in Ethiopia with USAID and Catholic Relief Services. This is a food for peace project, $110 million project. And we have a small role because of the connection between sanitation and food security. But our project is, you can see there some of the Ethiopians who uh, we trained uh, recently on one of the first toilets we built this year in uh, a clinic in Ethiopia. And our project's goals are to uh, work with the local stakeholders um, in the community. Uh, this is, we've learned, this is vital to uh, any, any successful project. And so, um, Livelihoods for youth and women is one priority of this project. Uh, we need behavior change. Uh, Ethiopia suffers from a very high open defecation rate. Um, and then uh, another important 
aspect of this is microfinancing and marketing to help develop small businesses uh, because you can't give away enough toilets to solve the sanitation problem. Uh, these toilets were begun in, uh, in Ghana and uh, developed there to be, because uh, my colleagues spent a year in Ghana on a sabbatical working with uh, the University of Ghana and Aseshi University. And they are now being used in uh, one project sponsored by the uh, World Bank, the Gamma Project in the uh, Accra area. But our partnership with uh, WPI began when I hired an engineer who was an Ethiopian, a graduate of WPI, that may be known to some of you as uh, Tameni Taldila. Tameni is there now in Ethiopia, and we're really happy with his work. And we're looking forward to a collaboration with WPI on uh, the many problems that are going to arise that we anticipate problems like um, transportation costs and materials. And also one of our goals is to work with the local vocational tech schools uh, to make building these toilets part of the curriculum. And uh, I know that WPI can also support us in valuable ways in that aspect of the project. And by that, I also mean bringing students and uh, research. There's, many, there's money also uh, in this project built in for research uh, on many of the ways that uh, we can use the compost from these toilets for fertilizing gardens that help with the nutritional needs of the country. Um, people's bellies might be full, but they're, they're lacking uh, important nutritional elements in that diet, which uh, gardens could, could supplement. And so uh, this is a budding partnership and uh, we're looking forward to uh, working with uh, WPI. That's my, that's my time. Thanks, Terry. Um, next is uh, Professor Fred McBangaluri. He is the president and provost of Academic City College in Accra, Ghana. And uh, I'll turn it over to Fred, and I will invite everybody to ask questions in the Q&A. Thank you. Hey, guys. I hope everyone can see me and hear me, at least. Yes, we can, I can hear you. All right. So I guess it's good afternoon to you guys. Uh, Good morning to others and good evening somewhere else. Uh, thank you so much, Rob, for inviting me. I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to participate in the Global School. Um, Academic City has been around for about three years now. Small university on the outskirts of Accra. And I'm happy to tell you guys, last week we achieved a university college status. And um, the magnitude of that is even Nashasi University took 15 years to achieve same. So we must be doing something here that stakeholders are enthusiastic about. So what I thought I would share with you guys is the ventilator project that uh, we initiated at the beginning of the COVID um, when the general consensus was that we only have 67 of such functioning ventilators in, in our continuum of care. And so I got together with second year engineering students and we started looking at the possibilities of designing one locally, um, using local materials, things that were readily available uh, for obvious reasons that in, in times of crisis like this, uh, it's impossible to move systems like this across borders, even if you had the money to do that. So that was one goal. The second goal, obviously, since I returned after 25 years, and I'm certainly one of the guys uh, His Excellency was talking about, you know, uh, returning to find the challenges here and trying to find ways to plug them. So I've also been working actively with young folks to begin to stay the innovation ecosystem uh, and obviously to convince them that we can actually design stuff uh, that are relevant to our environment. So one of such projects is this, there are many more that we're working on and I just wanted to share some really unique features uh, that also goes in to support the fact that development engineering is the way forward. So without further ado, I would like the slide move to the next one. 
So what you see in the center here is the guts of our ventilator, is the non-invasive type. Um, obviously, we had challenges moving to the invasive type because we needed components from abroad. But you can see two parts of batteries to the left that can actually run this wooden structure for 12 hours. You can run it off electricity. You can run it off your car batteries. And on the top right hand corner, you will see a solar controller. So you can actually charge this battery using a solar. And so for 12 hours, you can essentially move from any part of Ghana with the patient in critical care with a mask supplying medical air to them until you can get into a facility where they can be supported. Now, the energy requirements here obviously drove some of the decisions that went into this. Um, it, we, we live in an environment where sometimes you're out of electricity. So 12 hours can get you going. Um, if you are transporting the patient, you can use your cigarette lighter to keep the system going. Um, and obviously you can also charge it. Now we want to get it to a point where this is in every vehicle that moves, whether it's a medical vehicle or not, almost like a, a fire extinguisher in every car. So that when you get, you chance an accident scene, you'll be able to provide some support to somebody struggling until medical personnel can get to them. Uh, we are fortunate enough to have gained the attention of GIZ, which is the German, German equivalent of the USAID, and they are committing about 200,000 euro uh, to this effort. So, I, I, you know, the bottom line is that there is expertise um, and we need to begin to drive our institutions in the directions where they can see tangible things coming out of academia. And that is really what is going to build a trust between the private and public institutions um, and, and, and industry in general. And so this is a, is a beginning of an effort. We are still working to refine it. We are still um, focus completely on readily available. It was anticipated that the streets of Africa was going to be lined up with gasping individuals looking for air to keep them alive as COVID uh, continues to ravage across the continent. Uh, for good fortune, that hasn't happened yet. But I don't think anybody is, 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 is out of this until we are really out of it. So uh, the, the beauty about the angle we are also coming from is that even in the absence of COVID, the African healthcare continuum still need ventilators to keep people alive. To many places, we continuously hear about people coming to hospital to die because there was a last canister of oxygen sitting somewhere and it was meant for emergency. And those people might have died because their situation wasn't considered emergency enough. So um, in short, you know, these are baby steps, um, trying to reconfigure this ecosystem to develop systems that are relevant uh, and can be used locally and involves local content as well as local know-how. Um, and in the spirit of development engineering, that is the only way that um, local you know, countries and local communities will continue to embrace stuff. They are not going to embrace stuff that they really do not understand where it comes from, or they will embrace it for a short while and, dis and, and disregard it. Um, you know, if I have to go back to undergraduate again, I think I'm gonna go to WPI. Um, I really like what you guys are doing there. We're working very hard to build some really strong collaboration between Academic City and WPI. Uh, Robert has been our champion. Wale, who also doubles as my PhD advisor, um, has been a champion of what we are trying to do here. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how we can you know, integrate resources from across, uh, learn from you guys, um, and, and continue to help our country make decisions um, that will help in our development efforts. So I appreciate and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you very much, Fred, for that uh, wonderful talk. And uh, I, I followed you as you were developing this 
uh, ventilator and I'm really happy to see it in its final form. So thanks for sharing that with us. Our next speaker is Dr. Solomon Mensa, who's a university postdoc at, um, here at WPI. Uh, he sh shares his time. So that we don't get down to nothing in there. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. But it's a, it's Somebody's a, got their hello. mic on that they might want to turn off. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, Solomon. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, about every day, about 6,700 uh, neonatal babies die in low to middle income countries due to lack of medical devices and services. Now, the physiology explains that these premature babies have underdeveloped lungs, and so they are not able to breathe. In addition to that, they are also not able to feed. What we're working in collaboration with the Ghana Project Center is to develop low cost, easy to maintain, and less uh, 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 equipment that are less dependency on consumables and also the power grid. Now, in collaboration with uh, the Biomedical Engineering Department here at University of, uh, of uh, the VPI, as well as the University of Ghana and the business school, we are coming up with projects that would specifically work to resolve some of these issues. Now, the first project is uh, the air, what we call the air baby, which is a respiratory assist device for premature babies to help these babies' uh, lungs, uh, help them breathe. And then the second project, which one of my students will be talking about in this program is the feeding pump, which will work in collaboration with the air baby to help feed these babies. Um, in addition to that, we also have what we call um, a, a graduate course that we just instituted at the BME department at the BPI that is to train graduate students on global medical device design for global health and looking at specifically why some of these devices are not working and, and how we can redesign some of these devices to make them usable in, in low to middle income countries. Um, can you go up a little bit for me because I can't see the bottom piece. Uh, and then finally, I think what we are also working on is coming up with a center for design entrepreneurship education in collaboration with the Ghana Project Center to help uh, train uh, the BPI students and also Ghanaian students on innovation and product development techniques that will be very useful in their areas, as well as seven as a launch pad for promising startups that would be able to use this, this technology or this design center to come up with very meaningful medical devices that would help serve the need of people, not only in Ghana, but as well as low to middle income countries across Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you, Solomon. Uh, Jer Jerma? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Gemma Kamara, and I am a faculty at uh, WPI. I also am the founder of um, HP Gistritis Foundation that is based in Liberia. And um, I have connections with a lot of things in here with um, Providence College alumni and also um, having worked volunteer when I was in college um, with Global Sustainable Aid Project uh, in Liberia. Um, and Ghana as well. And uh, so part of my, um, as a Liberian, I would like to also highlight that I was born in Liberia, raised in Worcester, Massachusetts. I've um, since been to Liberia several times. Um, I've always wanted to work in Liberia and in Africa. So um, having, um, starting a foundation was paramount to me. Um, and uh, what, what was also key um, and what drives me to Liberia consistently um, after, even after leaving, uh, after the Civil War, what was um, are some issues around health, um, health care, health education. Um, Mensa just mentioned about a device um, to help ne neonatal um, survival in, in Africa, starting with Ghana. Um, but just to look at some of the um, development indicators in Liberia, um, as far as um, uh, maternal mortality rates um, that is high as 66, um, 661 deaths per 100,000 live births um, in Liberia. Um, also looking at neonatal mortality rates, which is um, about 33 
um, deaths per four or per 100, uh, 1,000 live births, uh, births, excuse me. And also looking at numbers or data around um, the number of, um, of, um, of, of students that graduate from high school, which is so, um, the age is so high, um, age 25, that's the um, average age that a lot of uh, young people graduate from high school in Liberia. And another number, um, which is across Africa, um, is the is the uh, high number of young people who are, um, for Liberia specifically, over 60% of the population um, are between the ages uh, from zero to age 25. So all of these numbers are numbers that have been used to determine if um, economic development or uh, how to develop sustainable programs for, for Africa. Um, and so with a, a background in public health, um, and uh, with passion for uh, global health um, and with support from, of course, Providence College, Dr. Mecca, um, Global Sustainable Aid Project, and now as a faculty at WPI, um, HB Gitschunas Foundation was founded uh, since 2016. We do have an office base here in Worcester, Massachusetts at uh, 44 Portland Street, and as well as in Liberia, where we are uh, targeting health uh, uh, school-based health programs and also technology for schools. And in our health for schools, we're looking at the the model of uh, the whole whole school, uh, whole community, and whole child. Because uh, there's research that shows that um, mental, physical, psychosocial, even community agencies involvement and also per parental roles um, help to ensure advancement for for young people. Um, at least that's data for it's true for. Uh, the U.S. Um, and we're looking at incorporating incorporating programs that it's wrap around services for private for rural schools uh, that are owned by people passionate in their communities to provide these services. So since 2016, we've been working in six rural schools um, that are owned by people, not private school in the nature. And um, a lot of these schools are under resourced. We've been able to. Firstly, start with uh, uh, developing or establishing and constructing latrines, the micro flush latrine, and then we moved on to um, to um, the, the lab in the box, uh, which is an e-technology uh, uh, setup that provides technology laptops uh, to schools. It also provides a solar panel to be able to power those um, those laptops as well as um, there's an offline portal that gives schools rich resources using Khan, from Khan Academy and the whole um, um, uh, 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 bunch of uh, resources from other offline sources that are compiled into an offline version of an inter uh, um, offline internet. And uh, we've been able to do that and I'll donating over 40 laptops and 17 desktops in Liberia and also incorporating the solar panel um, training teachers, that's a, a main thing, a part of our program is not um, is to train teachers and to also allow the school to have a buy-in with any programs that we do partner with. So our model is uh, rather than um, being the the, the, the the agency that comes with the solution, we also incorporate uh, solutions and partnerships from all of the schools that we work with um, we, um, in training teachers and allowing them to use the offline resource to their abilities um, and to their subject matters. Um, for the six schools, I did not mention um, the, the, the grades are from um, K to 12 uh, uh, with uh, that consists of those schools. And um, I'm proud to say that um, I'm currently as a faculty in the um, interdisciplinary and global studies department um, that is engaged with project-based um, uh, in projects in across the across the um, world, specifically um, um, and uh, specifically uh, with the class that is working with me with HVK is um, stationed here in Worcester, and they're doing research with HVK because I, I mentioned we have an office based here, and um, uh, in, in to ensure that the, the technology is um, is um, um, has more resources. And, um, and looking at other ways that we can use uh, uh, technology to empower schools and to engage students in, in, um, in, in knowing how to use uh, the uh, laptops, how to use technology and how to incorporate that into learning. Um, and then lastly, I would like to talk about the MOAB in terms of the partnership with, um, uh, with the African community here. 
It's another organization um, looking at working with Africans here in Worcester, which is the Massachusetts Organization for African Descendants. Um, also um, an, a, a, more, a group that is focused um, just with the Africans here in Worcester and that I'm also engaged with. And in closing, I would like to say that um, um, with whether working with Africans in Africa or working with, with Africans here in Worcester, um, the whole goal is to, is to empower Africans to, for them to be the ones with the solutions um, and driving key projects that will um, improve advancement uh, for Africans in the diaspora in Africa and also living here in America. Thank you. Thank you, Gemma. That was very nice. Um, next, we have uh, Maron Tedese. Uh, she's a graduate student in our master's degree in science and technology for innovation and global development. Mary? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Maron Tedese. Thank you for introducing me, uh, Professor Rob. Uh, so, like I said, my name is Miran. I was born and raised in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. I moved to the United States about four years ago to uh, complete my bachelor's degree. Um, so my dream has always been and will always be uh, trying to make a lasting impact on Africa. Uh, I recently graduated with my bachelor's degree in chemical engineering, but I decided to continue my master's in science and technology for innovation and global development. Uh, my dream about making a lasting impact was first brought to life during my third year uh, when I got a chance to travel to Namibia. So my team and I, we co-created an online interactive module that focused on teaching uh, sustainability in Namibia. Uh, I was also fortunate enough to travel Ghana under the guidance of Dr. Rob Kruger. Uh, my team here, um, we worked alongside uh, high school students um, and high school like uh, teachers to code uh, develop a triple layer activated carbon uh, and clay sawdust water filter in Ghana. And this was done by using locally sourced material that ensured the longevity and the success of the project. The purpose of this water filter was to um, supply clean water and built in a village with um, had mercury problems in their water as a result of an unsustainable uh, small scale uh, gold mining practices in the region. Uh, while doing this project, I was inspired and I uh, learned a lot about the complex understanding that needs to come with working on these intercultural projects, as long as uh, along with uh, transferring technologies uh, across nations, uh, which led me to decide to pursue my master's in science and technology for innovation and global development. Uh, with this project, I get to make an impact today. I get to make a change in Africa today. And I'm currently working on recycling gold from um, electronic waste, which is a project that has been mentioned uh, previously with other people talking on this um, today. Uh, well, with that said, I uh, would like to say thank you for listening uh, to me and pass it on to my fellow WPI student, Joelle Hanley. Hi, everyone. I am a senior biomedical engineering student at WPI. This year, I'm working on my major qualifying project, which is WPI's version of a capstone project. Our team consists of four stu WPI students, including myself and two students from the University of Ghana. As Dr. Mensa mentioned, we are working on developing a feeding and drug delivery pump for premature babies in low to middle income countries with a focus in Ghana. This is important because every year, 3 million infants worldwide don't survive the first 28 days of life. Of these, 99, of these deaths, 99% occur in low to middle income countries and 98% are due to the infant's inability to coordinate suck, swallow, and breathing mechanisms. These infants are unable to feed orally and require feeding tubes to thrive. Um, the existing feeding methods used in these countries can either be harmful to the infant or tiresome to the clinicians. Our team is looking to develop a safer feeding and drug delivery method for these infants while minimizing healthcare professional oversight. So that's kind of a brief overview of the project, project itself. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about my experience working on this team. 
So some of you may know that WPI opened a global project site in Ghana last year, it was mentioned before. Um, and usually students travel abroad to complete a project by working with a community to solve a problem. Um, but this project itself is unique in that we have students from universities in different countries working together to solve a global problem. I think I can speak for my team in saying that working on this project has been a really valuable experience. Um, we've each brought something unique to the team that's impacted the way that we've approached this challenge. And we've learned a lot about each other and ourselves along the way. Um, we just started this project, but I'm excited to see where this year takes us and what we're able to accomplish. And thank you all for listening. I am turning it back over to Rob Kruger. Thank you, Joelle. And thanks to the panelists. Um, very inspiring talks and um, a lot of a lot of different um, opportunities and uh, experiences that are have been described by the, the panelists. Um, we're open to questions. I have a few here already, but um, if you have a question for any of the speakers, including the ambassador, please uh, type them into the Q&A and we will do our best to um, accommodate you. Um, the first question comes from uh, for Solomon. Uh, Solomon, um, what got you interested in uh, neonate research? Thank you so, uh, so much, Rob, for the question. Um, a couple of years back, I took a trip back home to Ghana to really have a good understanding of what the medical needs were. <clears throat> so I went to multiple hospitals across the country. And one of the uh, overwhelming theme that I identified was the fact that there was less or, or low medical devices available uh, to treat prematurity. And in collaboration and discussions with a lot of the clinicians, they you know, expressed the the need or the, uh, the hope that they would have medical devices that are low to that are low cost and easy to maintain, as well as do not depend heavily on consumables and the power grid. And so when I came back, I, I put a couple of students together and we started on this journey to re redesign basically medical devices uh, uh, to make them affordable and easy to use in low to middle income countries. Now, if you think about it, the medical device industry here uh, see those kind of markets as, as very little in terms of profit. And so they don't spend a lot of time in, in, in you know, attracting so much of the, of, of the business there. The goal of this whole project is to make sure that we look at all of the medical devices that are being produced for the space of neonatal care and take away all the best bells and whistles and give the community back a device that that you know would would be able to withstand all the environmental conditions as well as uh, 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 the uh, reduce the complexity so that people can actually use the device and and, uh, and make sure that some of these babies survive. Now, to give you a very quick example, one of the hospitals that I visited uh, had a very complex uh, respiratory assist device that had a broken screen. And because of that, the device was not used and was just collecting dust. Mind you, there was a baby in the ward at that moment that was being resuscitated because the oxygen level was extremely low and the baby was almost gone. And so that tells you that all of the complexities and the bells and whistles that are incorporated in these devices are usually not helpful when you go to low to middle income countries. And that's why I think uh, it, it just triggered me to think about engineering these devices from a whole different perspective where all the bells and whistles will be removed or taken out of the process and give them the barest device that would help the baby survive. Thank you. Thank you, Solomon. Thank you, Solomon. Um, our next question is for Jerma. And I'm sorry I didn't give you a chance to finish your thoughts on this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you that opportunity right now. Um, you mentioned the Massachusetts Organization of, uh, for African Descendants. And for those of you who don't know, uh, Ghana, um, I'm sorry, Worcester boasts a 20,000 plus uh, community of Ghanaians um, that's, that's been around for, for quite some time. And they represent a, a significant part of our, our city life. And we, again, we have Liberians, we have Somalis, we have Ethiopians, Nigerians, among others. And so, Gemma, you're involved in organizing these folks. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about um, 
uh, how you plan on doing this and what do you see the capacity of this organization to become? Thank you. So the Massachusetts Organization for African Descendants uh, started this year. Uh, there are some key leaders who are from, I'm from a Liberian community. Uh, we also have leaders from the Ghanaian community. We have Nigerian leaders um, and you can name it. Uh, we're all a part of this coalition. We all saw that we need to come together because in Worcester, the Africans, uh, the African community is not at the table. And um, a little short history for, about my, with myself, I uh, ran for a local election in Worcester last year and I saw the huge disparity going from uh, wars, the different wars and precincts and such, um, and with the, with the, the t on th and being a part of tables where there weren't Africans. So uh, that's so that's the reason, one of the reasons that really pushed us to formulate this coalition. And we have subcommittees where we deal with advocacy, so try um, uh, to encourage Africans in Worcester to uh, be educated on the voting process here. We've done work with the census. Um, 2020 was this major, major census year for us, um, going to the churches, doing outreach into the churches. We also plan to look at how um, to see how policies affect the African community here. We also have a subcommittee that deals with public health and social services. During COVID, we learned that um, services were available, but members of the African community we're not being, we're not getting access to these, or had lack of knowledge. And so there's a um, WPR group that is actually working with me, with me this year uh, to tackle food insecurity um, by the development or establishment of a food pantry, which is going to be at the 67 Vernon Street. That is the United um, or the New England um, SDA Church. That is a, a huge Ghanaian church based on um, at that location. And uh, we're also doing research as far as to understand what is the magnitude of food insecurity in the African community. We are also doing um, assets to document the assets of our, the African community here, uh, looking at the businesses, the churches, um, and what constitute as assets in our community. community. Um, and then lastly, of course, we have other subcommittees that do, deals with public education. Uh, our African kids uh, are in the public schools here. And if you're attuned to what is going on in, in the city, um, it's um, a high interest for us to be to have such conversations to ensure that African students move forward in the education system here and becoming a student at WPI and hopefully going back to Africa one day to do amazing things. And um, for any other information, my um, number or my email can be shared with um, with this, my my WPS email, my first and last name at wpi.edu. And um, we are hoping that with uh, WPI having this. Um, partnership here and in Africa that we will also um, be a partner with WPI to help us um, advance the um, conditions of Africans living in Worcester. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremiah. Appreciate it. Um, we have a, a good friend who's asked a question and colleague, uh, Trent Masiki, uh, and he asks, um, can each of the panelists talk about the influence of the humanities and how, it, how they conceived and implemented their, pro their projects. Um, so I, I, we don't have time to ask everybody that, but I'd like to ask two people in particular because I, I know they have a, a certain perspective. And uh, Joelle, I'd like to ask you, and then uh, Dr. Fred, uh, I'll ask you as well. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, I, to go back a little bit, I worked on my interactive qualifying project last year in a small village called Achim Janasi. And um, we created and implemented a library for the village. Um, and that was an interesting experience for me because I wanted to go abroad really bad, but I was unable to go abroad. So I actually completed that project remote. Um, so that was kind of like not unheard of, but it was very, it was a very new and unique experience to do that. And working on that project and getting to know those people and make connections um, really inspired me to want to do something further. And I can't take credit for the project. Um, Rob Kruger hooked me up with the project. So thank you to him and Dr. Mensa. Um, but I think that kind of speaks to, I started off broad and then focused in because I wanted something for my major, a project for my major. Thanks, Joelle. Uh, how about you, Dr. Fred? Do you... 
Well, my journey into medical devices started, of course, with a personal event when I was assaulted as a PhD student at the University of Dayton, and I almost died. <laughs> and, you know, the interactions that I had with my nurses, my doctors were quite a life-changing experience for me. I remember having a nurse one night, a male nurse, in his 60s, and I actually thought he was a doctor because of the long cloak he had and the stethoscope. And when he heard my story that I was a PhD student, he sat on the side of my bed and he said, you know, I actually had a heart attack when I was 50 years old. And I was given such good treatment by the nurses and doctors that I decided to go to nursing school at age 52. I was the oldest in my class. And at first the young kids were laughing at me, but when they heard my story, they actually supported me. And I've been practicing as a nurse for the last six years and I'm enjoying every bit of it, but I came into nursing by accident. And that really, really touched me, you know, that we can actually, even in adversity, we can find opportunities to extend a hand to others. And I spent all my career, the 16 years that I was in industry was completely in the medical devices, medical equipment field. Um, and I don't think that was what I, what I was thinking when I first went to graduate school. You know, I thought I was gonna graduate and go teach aeronautics, astronautics somewhere else. And then I ended up in medical devices. And so, you know, from time to time when I would come to Ghana, um, visit hospitals, visit people, I actually saw a deterioration that what it was is now different from even what, what it was when I was here. Uh, beautiful hospitals, nice whitewashed hospitals had now turned into abatrosis of death. And so with all this experience that I have, the question is, you know, can we begin to at least make syringes here? Can we make simple devices? Um, and so for me, you know, medical devices and equipment is a personal journey. And, and, I, and I think it's the most exciting part of engineering because that's actually the place where you can apply broad knowledge from transdisciplinary, as Robert would say, it's really what comes into building medical devices and equipment that will make an impact on people's lives. So that's the people aspect of what I do. Thank you, Dr. Fred. Uh, Your Excellency, there's another question uh, for you. Um, how do you, Think, uh, what do you think the role of Africana Studies should be in WPI's global school? Well, I, I, am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Well, you see, um, Africana Studies in a place like WTI, we'll, we'll have to, uh, WPI will have to be a little away from the, the classical uh, Africana studies where people were engaged in uh, learning about ancient cultures and, you know, the, the putting a lot of emphasis on, you know, where people have moved to in terms of their Sociocultural, you know, uh, ambiance. I think Africaners, you know, studies these days will have to put a lot more emphasis on the newer areas of knowledge, which are going to make a certain kind of impact on, uh, you know, the the African living environment, and that would include improvements in the economy improvements in education, improvements in the strategy of you know, delivering learning, because I mean, that has changed. And we are in a situation where these days, you know, uh, maybe thanks to COVID, a lot of uh, kids in this country are studying from home with the uh, support of uh, you know, machinery like we are using today. But then the greater proportion of African school children are not going to have access to you know, these kinds of devices. So Africana studies will have to concentrate on 
a certain kind of new forms of delivery of you know teaching and learning basically to in, uh, individuals and groups of individuals but more importantly we have to concentrate on one the relationships between uh, africans uh, you know learning organizations two relationships between african learning organizations and external learning organizations and then three a certain effort at the uh, you know at imparting knowledge and developing strategies for sustaining you know uh, certain kinds of improved levels of uh, of existence i don't think um, we now have to spend a lot of time uh, talking about you know uh, the battle of ngungundlubu you know in south africa in whatever you know year that happened but we ought to be talking about the effects of some of the current uh, you know issues and problems as they impact on uh, african uh, learning in fact africana studies ought to be modernized that's that's basically what i'm looking at and the subject areas so they could have to be very contemporary Thank you, sir. Uh, we have a, uh, one time for one last question, and it comes from uh, Morali, and he says, Dr. Kruger, from my own direct experience, one of the challenges faced by recreating medical devices which already exist is that they are not economically sustainable. For example, even though the new crafted medical device works, private clinics doctors prefer to purchase branded, refurbished if need be, devices from established vendors. Can anyone on the panel share a successful story uh, of an economically sustainable medical device? Solomon, uh, Dean Gorawando, Fred, anybody? Well, the, um, thank you very much. I just, I just wanna react quickly to this question. Now, some of the locations that we, 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 we went through our travels had nothing. But when I say nothing, they, they barely have anything at all to help uh, some of these babies survive. Now, and when we had a, a further conversations with them, the issue was budgeting in the sense that they don't even have enough money to run their clinics day to day. And so then the question is, if, if they don't have enough money to run their day to day uh, clinics, um, they, they would not have enough money to purchase state of the art devices to help run their clinics. And that's where our design philosophy comes in in the sense that um, we are going to work to build systems or, or medical devices that would give them something to use instead of having nothing. Now, in terms of building a sustainable business, the key is not to give these devices out for free because the point is you need to be able to build a sustainable business, move on from product to product in order to help resolve some of the issues that are pending in the healthcare system, particularly in some sections of Ghana. And so these devices are not meant to be for free, but would help the students to come up with ventures that they can then move on from the project center to continue to develop these ventures into sustainable businesses. Uh, I don't know if I reacted well to your question, but that's just my take. Thank you, Solomon. Anybody else want to comment on that quickly? Yeah, yeah. So let me let me let me jump in here. I think um, when you talk about system sustainability, uh, you have to look at it beyond the use case that Solomon has just touched on. I know there is a use there is a, a case study uh, from many years ago. I forgot exactly the equipment, but I would guess it's an ultrasound machine that GE was trying to sell in China. And the transportation system in China at the time was so poor that by the time these machines would get to the rural areas, they were broken. And so the Chinese were not interested in the cumbersome ultrasound machines. So eventually GE put together a, a team comprising Chinese engineers and scientists on one end and American engineers, and they redesigned that product for the Chinese market. So anytime you see these portable, uh, ultrasound machines, it could have come from that project. The beauty about that project was that 
uh, the original one was sent without local content, without local experience, without the understanding of that environment, and they were rejected. The re-engineered one with local content could be carried into the interior. But then the flip side of this particular issue was that in the developed world, there are remote areas. There are remote areas in Canada that are 500 kilometers off grid. And so such equipment started having a use over there as well. So I think sustainability uh, in this case is that GE found a market in China, reconfigured their product for the market and also found local application near home. So I think there's an opportunity here really for what Solomon is doing to take out all these whistles and bells that from my experience coming from the medical devices space are just to make the product look beautiful and look better than the competition, but they are really not actively involved in that continuum of care. At Kolebu Teaching Hospital, anytime the ventilators are beeping, they just slap them, okay? So all this alarm system just prevents people from <laughs> delivering care. So I think there is room for this kind of uh, minimalist redesign of products in this marketplace. Thank you, Dr. Fred. You have the last word. Um, uh, actually, I lied. I get the last word. <laughs> but before before I, I give you that, let's just uh, have a round of applause from the group. Thanks to the panel. Thank you very much uh, for all of your efforts. And I'm grateful that you showed up today to participate in this. But most importantly, I commend you all and appreciate very much the work that you uh, that you do on a daily basis um, to help us realize some of these um, visions. I want to just wrap up by saying uh, a few words. Uh, first, I'd like to thank His Excellency, uh, the Ambassador, um, for coming. He made a trip up from Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, to spend a uh, couple of days here with us to have conversations and to, to share his wisdom. So. Uh, uh, grateful to him to, for making that effort. Um, uh, Dean Gorwando didn't have to travel, but uh, thank you so much for um, coming across, uh, you know, nine different time zones to, to be here. Um, we appreciate uh, your efforts and we um, cherish the partnership that we're developing. Uh, as for the panelists, thank you all very much. Uh, as Fred McBanganluri says, he and I are sometimes tied at the hip. And um, we're going to keep moving to, to push things forward, um, uh, both in West Africa, but across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. I just want to say a couple of uh, final words. Um, and, and it's been pointed out by many of the speakers here today. And that's that WPI, at WPI, we acknowledge the long history of science, the scientific method, technolo technology, and innovation that has occurred in Africa. We've seen material uh, um, uh, references to that today uh, through uh, the provost presentation, but we've also heard about it through many of the, the speakers that we've um, heard from. It's no longer in good conscience can we have uh, be prescriptive in our approach to how we engage with anywhere in the global south, not just Africa. Uh, it's unconscionable to do that in these days. The Global South should no longer be viewed as a place with problems where we transfer our knowledge and expertise to solve them. We have to engage in a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, way uh, to where we develop potential solutions together. We define problems together uh, in a way that leverages the um, uh, creative capacity of both uh, our uh, counterparts abroad, as well as our own expertise here. I mean, if we, we just have to look, uh, for example, you know, if we think about climate change adaptation, um, Africa has a long history and heritage of pastoralism, which is a wonderful way to think about climate change adaptation, which is of course being lost as um, uh, farmers, I'm sorry, pastoralists are being uh, encouraged to become farmers. Um, through the uh, project funded by Intel uh, on e-waste in Zimbabwe and in Ghana both, we've seen um, uh, waste processors 
who don't have a college degree, who might not have any formal education beyond a certain grade, but they have um, IP that is valuable, uh, not only to their own livelihoods, but potentially to um, the design and uh, uh, implementation of uh, computer technology. Um, and then finally, we have to acknowledge all the different forms of know knowing to use fancy words, the different epistemologies, the different cosmologies that exist that not only do we get from understanding science and innovation, but as uh, Dr. Maziki pointed out, through understanding literature and understanding the, the experience that has happened um, in, in uh, places outside the United States and take that seriously. And as the ambassador pointed out, as all rivers flow to the ocean, um, Africa's problems uh, our problems are obviously Africa's problems, but Africa's problems are also our problems. And we need to work together to resolve those together in a way that captures the talent, the innovation, innovative capacity, and the new ways of understanding problem solving um, and, impl problem, uh, and implementation of those problems in ways that make sense for everybody across the world, no matter who you are. There's a feminist theorist, her name is Donna Haraway, and she uses the concept of kin to, under, to talk about um, how we can live in a world of multi-speciesism, where we all uh, share this world with other species. And I commend her for that. But today, the conversation I think that we have to understand is that we have kinship across the pond to our, brethren and sis our brothers and sisters in Africa, um, because we do share the same problems. We do uh, share um, the future of humanity and we need to work together to preserve that, not only for our species, but other species as well. So I think Rachel has an, a final slide. Um, next month uh, is the Latin America uh, portion of the virtual event series. And we encourage everybody to come to that. I thank you. Uh, for your time today, your interest, and look forward to carrying on this conversation um, in the future. Thank you very much.